Good morning. <laughs> My name is George Husney. My name is George. Oh, you're you're Simon. <laughs> um, there is a reason why you are here, and I can I probably don't know all the different reasons, but I believe you are interested in reaching Muslims for Christ. Any objection to this? Are you? Do you agree with me? And um, as I have traveled around the world, and I still do, I have seen a lot of people in mission who have um, left home, sold their houses, gave away their furniture, or sold them at garage sale price, and uh, basically uprooted themselves and gone to a faraway country subjected their wives and children to difficult lifestyles. And then uh, a year later, two years later, three years later, and in some cases, five years and 10 years later, they pack up and go home. And many of them go, return in defeat, feeling they have not really made any difference. <coughs> I was uh, in Morocco in a city a few years ago, and the pastor of the International Church drove me to the airport, uh, drove me back to the airport. And I asked him, uh, you're pastoring the International Church, like you do, Mike, in <coughs> Tunis. Uh, what is the uh, ratio of people who stay on and those who go back? He says 50% uh, of the missionaries in the city, and he'd been there many years, return within three years. So what is the solution? <laughs> I am, as you will see hopefully in the coming days, I'm very passionate about fruitfulness in our ministry. I'm not passionate about hyperactivity, although I'm very hyperactive -y <laughs> kind of guy, <laughs> hyperactive. But I am passionate to see every one of us, me included, fruitful in, uh, in our ministry. And fruitful, according to Jesus, has two qualities in John 15. One uh, in verse 8, it says, much fruit. And in verse 16, it says, fruit that will last. So those two qualities of fruit is that much and lasting fruit. Uh, it wouldn't be uh, exciting for a farmer to work on planting uh, a whole field and finding in the apple tree one apple, and in the uh, wheat stalk just one grain. It wouldn't be too exciting, is it? would it? Uh, so it's fruit, but it's not much fruit. And God wants us, as Jesus said, I have chosen you to go and bear fruit that will last. And in verse 8, it says much fruit. What are the secrets? What I have seen in uh, many years of my ministry, four decades plus now, uh, a lot of people are looking for tools. They're looking for a technique. They're looking for strategies. And the latest strategies are hailed to be the best. That's why about 35 years ago, a book uh, came out with the title New Paths, New Paths, New Ways for Muslim Evangelism. And the newness is, uh, according to Western culture, is best. The latest software upgrade is better than the earlier ones. And, uh, and the latest uh, computer, latest cell phone, the latest 
TV, now we have a smart TV, we can download directly from it. It's best. And it is true in technology and it's true in many things, but it's not true in regard to truth. Principles in nature have always been there. They're ancient, some say millions of years, and the creation scientists say for thousands of years. Nevertheless, they're old and ancient. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He does not change with the whims, with the cultural changes and political situations. Truth and principles remain the same. So far, so good? Are we in agreement? So what is the secret of success for a missionary? I'm 100% convinced, and if I could say 120% or 200% convinced, that the secrets are spiritual. They're not tech, tactical or technical or strategic. Although I don't uh, shy away from strategy and tactics, these are necessary. We could reuse wrong tactics, and we don't want to. But even if we do use wrong tactics, but we are right with God, and we are spiritually uh, filled with the Holy Spirit, God will even uh, overlook our bad strategies. Now, we don't need to learn bad strategies so that God will be honored. Paul addressed that in Romans 5 and 6 in regarding to sin. Let's not sin more so that grace may abound. So we will try as much as possible to learn what are the best techniques, even the latest techniques, whatever techniques there are in communication, in how to present the gospel, any illustrations we may learn. We need to learn all that stuff. But let's not depend on them. As much as the Bible tells us that those who trust in chariots and horses to win the war will not make it because the battle is the Lord's. And in the spiritual realm, it is very much so. The battle is the Lord's. So let's look at uh, your first uh, lesson after the the notes here, after the one, two, three, the sections. The first section, worthy of the calling. This comes straight from Ephesians 4, chapter uh, 4, verse 2. It says, live a life worthy of the calling. And so I selected for the first passage, 2 Peter, chapter uh, 1, and verse 10, and later on you're going to have a little time to go over the whole chapter. It says, therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to, conform, to conf confirm your calling, to confirm your calling and election, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. We're going to learn what these things are, but at this point I want to emphasize the calling. Are you called by God to do what you are going to be doing or you are doing? Or is it because you were sitting in church and a missionary came from some hinterland and gave a great presentation and challenged you that there's a need for English teachers in this country or for medical doctors? or for missionaries, or evangelists, or disciples, or pastors, or any, and so you said, well, I can do that. And then you called yourself to it. I want us to be sure that we are called. Because if you are sure you are called, nothing will stop you. The one who is called by God is equipped by God. Because he who is calling us, who called us, will do it. 
if we are living according to His will and purpose, and we are obeying the call, nothing will stop us. We are invincible. The second point is about Ephesians 4, where it says, I urge you, he even says as a prisoner, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Now, if you know you are called, and you can actually pray about this calling, and you can affirm and confirm your calling if you're not sure of it through prayer and fasting, time with the Lord. If you are called, then you have to live a life that matches this calling, worthy of the calling. There are people who say, I can't go to missions because I'm not perfect. I have a sin, I have an addiction, I have this. That's not what I'm talking about. You will never be without sin as long as you live in this earth. But you are perfect in Christ because of His righteousness, not your own. As you put your trust in Him. Now this is a theological thing. You have to figure it out with your pastors and your professors of seminary, what this all means, or your own studies. So I'm not talking about being perfect in a sense of being sinless. Perfect in the Greek is, comes of, it's, uh, it's a similar to the word telescope, teleo. Teleo in Greek means reach the maximum you can. So let's take an example of a tree. A tree is uh, two months old. How tall is it? It's a little plant. When it's 10 years old, it's a big tree. But at every point of growth, from the time it was planted at a seed that you cannot even see it, to the time when it's fruitful and and, and, and beautiful and large and big, at every point, at every step, it was perfect tree. Perfect in the sense it, has, it is growing. It's doing the right thing to grow into that position of being very fruitful. And that's true in spiritual life as well. At every point when you are right with God, then you are perfect in Him. That's number three. And the goal, uh, Paul says, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up mature and perfect. Mature is in the Greek is perfect, but the NIV put the word mature. Attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Our goal in our Christian life is to be like Christ. And if we are doing what is right on a daily basis regarding pray, uh, reading and studying God's Word, being into, into the Word of God, and uh, living a life that uh, uh, matches the life of Christ in the steps of Christ, growingly, increasingly, then you have no worries, no fears about being fruitful in your, in your ministry to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ, the church, globally is reaching perfection. Matthew 5, 48, Jesus says, Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. What does it mean to be perfect? We're going to have to discuss that. Second page, called to be like God. <clears throat> In the next session, I'm going to be talking about God's cosmic drama. There's a story to God, God's love, and the story to the redemption. And that story began not 2,000 years ago, but it began at the creation. God has a purpose. He created us in His Dot, dot, dot. God created us in His image as, 
as such, we are, we were created perfect. We are created perfect. But then sin entered the world and messed us up. Marred the image of God in us. And Jesus came to restore that through his redeeming work on the cross. And if we come to him to help us get rid of the corruption that is, has entered us, Second Peter 1 talks about that, then we are restored back to his image and we are perfect in him. And our goal is to be again like him. We'll talk more about that in the next session. The next point is called to be ambassadors of Christ. If you are called to any task, God will enable you to do that task. Do you believe that? I have heard a lot of people say, well, I feel called, but, 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 <laughs> but in Arabic means what? <laughs> duck, duck, quack, quack, quack. <laughs> but I don't have enough support. But this country doesn't allow me to say anything. I can't witness here. I can't plant a church here. I can't distribute scripture. I can't bring in scripture. And every word I just said, I've heard it said by missionaries. I'm here, but I can't do it. If God called you, you can. And today we need to say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Can you say that? More than say that, believe it. Do you believe that God who called you is able to use you, able to protect you, maybe not even protect you because we're not called for protection and safety. And he sent you to represent him as an ambassador. An ambassador has authority, not just a job that draws salary, and status, I'm ambassador of my country. Ambassador represents his country and actually lives in a different country, but the complex, he lives, his, he lives in the house, the office, belong to his country. Right? The American embassy in Libya belongs to America, not to Libya. Iran, any, even enemy countries. If we have an ambassador there, that ambassador has to represent his country to the max. Are you allowed as an ambassador? Simon, you're the ambassador of Hong Kong in Boulder today. If you were officially sent and paid salary to represent Hong Kong. Are you allowed to lower the flag and hide your identity? Are you allowed to live in a country pretending to be an ambassador, but you're really not? You will not admit that you are an American or a Hong Kongian or any, you don't admit to be from that nation. And when you drive your car, you don't, you use a regular license plate, doesn't say ambassador on it, and the flag is not there. Once I was in Cairo driving in a narrow street and I saw a car coming the opposite way, which was a one-way road, and I was upset with him because I had been upset for six weeks when I was living in Egypt. I wanted to fix every driver, teach them how to drive. <laughs> Good luck. It hasn't worked 40 years later, still doing the same thing. And so I rolled the window down. I started shouting at this driver. It turned out to be the ambassador of Lebanon, my country. 
So I said, hi, how are you? Oh, nice to meet you. <laughs> how did I know he was an ambassador? As I rolled my window, I looked and I saw the flag on this car. He is proud to be Lebanese and he's obligated to be Lebanese by the fact that he is Lebanese and that he is the ambassador of his nation. How many of you and how many missionaries today go to a country, they're ashamed of the gospel, they're ashamed of Jesus, they're ashamed of the church, they're ashamed to be ambassadors of Christ. Not necessarily in their core identity inside, but socially, outwardly, denying that they belong to Jesus. I have met many of these. I pray that none of you will be one of those people. You are called to be an ambassador to fully represent him. Not only from authority and status and finances, but also in regard to God calling you to be an ambassador of Christ, the anointing of God, the touch of the Holy Spirit on your life. As you mingle with people, they got to see that. They got to feel that. They got to know there's something different about you. And that you don't belong to an earthly power, but you belong to heaven because you are the ambassador of heaven. And that's what sets you apart from the ambassador to a nation, to a political uh, uh, job. The spiritual job of, um, uh, of being rep representing heaven on earth is much greater and it needs to be very clear when people see you and interact with you. Number six here is called to a global vision. In Isaiah 49, 6, God says to Isaiah, and notice this about Isaiah. Isaiah was called to restore Jacob, his tribe, the Jewish tribe, because they had rebelled against God. And God elected, chose, and called Isaiah, like he did many others, prophets, Jeremiah, Josiah, and others, he called them to restore their people. And yet, God said to him, it is too small a thing for you to, to have this small vision of restoring your own people. We need a God-sized vision. And God's vision is to restore all nations to him. Back in Genesis 12, God said to Abraham, I will bless you, I'll make you a great nation, and I will make you a blessing to all peoples of the earth. All people, all nations, all tribes, all languages will be blessed by you. And brothers and sisters, each one of you, Tristan, you represent God in the same way Abraham did, the same way Moses did, the same way Elijah did, the same way Jesus did, the same way Paul and Peter and the apostles did. Today, you are his ambassador with a vision for the whole world to restore all nations and tribes and languages to the kingdom of God. Now, if we look at a, a survey of all those who were called by God in the Bible, all the New Testament, we have here six principles that I have derived from this page too. In every case, God took the initiative to call them. They didn't call themselves. Many times they weren't interested, they weren't involved, they're not in Christian work, they're not in God's work. Moses was a shepherd when he was called. And you know Gideon and, and, and Paul was against the church. They were not driven by the need of the world, but they were called directly by God. 
You need to be affirmed in that. You need to know 100%, Lord, did you send me here? When I stood at the borders with Serbia, with an American passport that was rejected, they didn't give me a visa, they wouldn't allow me in. And for hours I was haggling with the police about wanting to go in because I was, I knew God called me to Kosovo to begin to plant a church there and now it's become dozens of churches and thousands of Muslims have come to Christ. That was 21 years ago in June 1994. And I had at least 20 times, no, 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 you're not going in from human voices and from Satan whispering in my ears, why are you doing this? They're going to humiliate you. They're going to jail you. They're going to reject you like they did with all these stories that you heard. I stood at the border, sat on the bench and said, God, did you call me or did I call myself? And the answer came within a few minutes and they gave me a stamp. If you want to know that story, it's in my book and I will probably tell it to you in another session. God makes a way where there's no way. If you go by His authority and you trust Him, there's nothing you cannot do. You're there? But you need to be affirmed and, and, and be assured of His calling. Secondly, most of them hesitated and responded with fear and a sense of inadequacy. Gideon says, who am I? I'm from this little tribe. Jeremiah, the same thing, says, I'm just a child. Moses said, I can't even talk. Everyone hesitated because humanly speaking, humanly speaking, we cannot do it. Humanly speaking, I'm not able to save one soul, no matter how many techniques, no matter how many wonderful words I use and the great illustrations I have learned. No matter how many years of experience I've had, no matter how many books I've read, or how many degrees in Islamics I have earned. In myself, I am nothing. And Paul said that in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he says, who is Apollos, who is Paulos? Who is Paul, who is Apollo? Apollos? We are nothing. We're just servants of the Lord, trying each one to do our tasks according to what God has assigned to us, the different tasks. But he also said, I have come to you in fear and trembling, not with eloquence of words, not even though he was educated, he had fear and trembling, and yet boldly declared the gospel. Why? Because God enabled him, not because he was able in himself. Thirdly, they surrendered to God and obeyed the call. Moses finally, after arguing with God, he said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'll do it. I'll go. And that's what we need to do. Say, Lord, I will do it. If he tells you to go to that person that looks violent, he has a gun in his hand, and you're going to put your hand on his head and pray for him. Sarah has that story in Lebanon. <laughs> the general of police there who were arresting her. She prayed for him, and then he ended up paying her fees <laughs> to come to the States. God will enable you, He'll give you authority, He'll give you power. Just you need to believe Him, you need to trust Him. Surrender to Him and to His will and say, God, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. I'll go wherever you send me and nothing will stop me. Not even death, no threats, no dangers, nothing. Who will separate us from the love of God? Romans, Romans what? Romans 8. Fourthly, they trusted in God and put their faith in Him despite perceived danger. Read Hebrews 11. You'll find that to be true. 
Fifthly, they suffered and experienced persecution and hardships. Jesus did not call us to a wimpy little life. He called us to be powerful agents of heaven. And we have the, 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 the Lord of hosts as the commander in chief. Do you remember Elisha's servant? He said, look at all these vast numbers going up against us. He's, and he prayed, Lord, open his eyes. Open his eyes, saw hosts of angels. They're there. In faith we see the power behind us. In fact, ahead of us, when Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles 20 saw a vast army, and I had been in that place, En Gedi, En Gedi in Israel. I was there like five years ago and I preached this sermon, this, not this whole sermon, but about Jehoshaphat at that spot. He was backed up to a mountain and the Dead Sea is in front of him and an army coming from this side, another coming from here, ambushed completely, and they cannot go anywhere. And he said, Lord God, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Immediately God answered, he says, you will not fight this battle, for the battle is the Lord's. However, go. Don't just sit in your tents, because God will do it. Go to the end of the gorge and take your positions and watch the deliverance of the Lord. And they watched and they were amazed how these armies coming from here and here started fighting each other. They said, oh, he looks different, let's e kill him. He looks different, let's kill him. And the enemies of God's people destroyed each other and not one soul was lost that day of among God's army. Do we believe that God can make a way where there's no way? When we are backed up to a wall or to a sea that we cannot traverse and behind us is an army coming to kill us and a little stick, little stick struck the water and the water stood like a wall on both sides and God's people walked safely through. Do you believe that? Yes. Or are these myths? If you believe they're myths, you can quit today and we'll refund you. <laughs> I mean it. God is looking not for smart people, or handsome and beautiful people, tall or short and fat or, or thin. It's not about yourself. It's not about who you are, your character, your knowledge, your experience, your, your education. Are you called by God and do you believe Him? Yes. Then you're invincible. Nothing will touch you. No weapon forged against you will prevail. You have full immunity as the ambassador of heaven. But the minute you deny Jesus, you lose that immunity. And you are exposing yourself to danger, and God is going to let you have it. Sixthly, God demonstrated his power through them. We have a, we have a, a cloud of witnesses. A cloud of witnesses throughout the Bible. Not one of them who were called by God did dinky little tasks. They were all called for impossible jobs. Whether they're fighting with a few, let's look at an example, uh, 1 Samuel 14. Who is in 1 Samuel 14? Jonathan and his armor bearer. He was stupid from a human perspective. There were 600 people on the other side. 
and he was alone with his armor bearer. The armor bearer just carries all these spears and, and gives him one spear at a time. That's all he can do. He can't even fight because he's carrying these spears. And he's standing there and he looks and says, what do you think? Shall we go up against them? <laughs> and then he says, let's do it because First Samuel 14, 6, what does it say? Because, Simon, what does it say? <laughs> First, uh, read it. First Samuel 14, 6. For God is not restrained to save by many or by few. This man believed God, that God can do above and beyond what we can ask or even imagine, not just ask, even imagine. Who is your God? Is He God of the universe? Is He the God who made the heavens and the earth, the stars and the seas, who can with one word, with a puff, He can move stars around, whole galaxies. And you don't believe him to protect your little insect-sized body? Or to make a way which looks impossible to you, but there's nothing impossible to him? We need to believe God to do great things. And he has demonstrated in the scriptures and in history, and perhaps in your own life, whether it's miracles, answers to prayers, all kinds of things that are not possible humanly, but God has intervened. I want to end this session with this verse, 1 Thessalonians 5.24, the one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Let's read it together. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Wow! The Bible doesn't leave anything for us. Doesn't leave us questioning. Will he do it? Can he do it? What does it say here? He will! Not can. Of course we know he can. But will he? That's faith. That's trust in God. Will He do it? The one who called you is faithful and He will do it. Praise His holy name. Glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. The good news is Jesus is the good news. And He will come into, the, into your life, transform your own, and use you to transform others' lives. What a great privilege it is. Let us therefore live a life worthy of this amazing calling. It's not just a career. There's so much language in missionary writings that is stupid. <laughs> so much career in missions. It's not a career. It's a calling. And with the calling comes the anointing, the touch of God, the infilling of the Holy Spirit, the power of God at work in your life and through you. Why would a few words transform a life? I don't know. Simple words. Peter stood and spoke them in Acts 2. If you read them, it takes two or three minutes to read the whole sermon. Why would 3,000 people 
turn their lives upside down. It's the power of the... It said, they were pricked to the heart. Who pricked them? The Holy Spirit was there. So let us live a life worthy of the calling, which means all these things we talked about. We will be assured of our calling. We aim to live in the steps of Jesus, to be like Him, perfect in Christ. To be like God, restore the image of God that has been marred by sin and corruption. To be ambassadors, unashamedly, raising the flag of the gospel wherever we go, with a vision that's God-sized, global, even cosmic vision, and to trust Him with our lives and with our ministry. And then remember, the one who calls you is faithful, and He will do it. Is this a memory verse you're going to take away today? I recommend at the end of your notebook, you have a piece of paper where you would make some special notes. These special notes can be a verse that you wanted to memorize or an action plan. Because let me tell you, you're going to hear hours and hours of talking from this place. And you're not going to remember all of them. Right now, if you are impacted by, by a thought, by a concept, if you feel you need to make a decision, write it down at the end. Do you have you have a number of sheets here for that purpose. Fill them all. <laughs> you can actually make notes also to check something out later on. Say, uh, this title, page this, this, this verse, I want to check it out again. And then you could be using these notes for, in the future, to refer to action steps, memory verses, things to check out and to remember. Let's uh, close in prayer. Speak to God. Tell Him something that you heard Him today. Tell him that uh, you believe him. Confess if there's something to confess and make it right with him. And tell God, Lord, I really do want to live a life worthy of the calling. Help me. Thank you for your grace, for your mercy, for your goodness. Thank you that you are faithful, and thank you for your promises that you will do it. In Jesus' name, amen.